Hi, everyone. Uh, wow, what a great collection of projects we have heard today. I'm Sarah, and I carried out my Fulbright research at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile's Coastal Marine Research Station, which is in Las Cruces, right on the coast in the fifth region. And my project um, involved investigating kelp ecology perceptions and impacts of artisanal harvesting. So I did a combination of interviews with fishermen, participating in ongoing research happening at the marine lab, as well as developing my own experiments to further our understanding of the ecology of this natural resource. So kelp refers to, uh, comprises several different species of macroalgae, brown algae, that grow sometimes tens of meters of, at depth under the ocean surface. And they form these forests that are really, that support a really diverse community of fish and vertebrates. They serve as habitat, food, and refuge for these animals. And in Chile, as well as other countries around the world, they're harvested, used as a natural resource. So the three main species of kelp that are harvested in Chile are Lysonia nigrescens, which is an intertidal species, so it grows on the rocks, on the rocky shore. Macrocystis pyrifera, which um, grows in the subtidal, grows really tall, so you can actually see it floating on the surface. And then Lysonia trabeculata, which also grows in the subtidal, but it's much shorter, so sometimes you have to dive several meters down to see this forest. And for most of my studies, I focus on this last species, the Lysonia trabeculata. <clears throat> So kelp collection in Chile dates back several decades, but um, has intensified since around 2000, 2002, with increasing demand for alginates, which are extracted from kelp and used in lots of different commercial products, gels and food dyes and all sorts of things. And so what you're looking at this graph here shows the um, dry tons of kelp harvested from the three species and then the fourth line the topmost line is the sum of the two Lysonia species, the one intertidal growing on the rocks and the subtidal. Um, and so I was focusing on this subtidal Lysonia because it involves actually diving down and sometimes extracting the kelp from its base. And as you can see in this photo, it's um, extracted by the boatloads. Um, and this method of extracting the kelp from its base in Spanish is called barreteo. And so what this means is, so the, the kelp individuals, the, the base is this kind of gnarled structure that attaches to rocks and keeps the kelp stable there during with wave motion. And so in order to extract it using barateo, fishermen will dive down um, and use kind of an iron crowbar to pry it up off the rocks, and then tie it to a rope, and fishermen at the top of the boat attending will pull up the kelp. And so it's harvested this way, kind of going through the forest and pulling it up. And so we wanted to understand the impacts of harvesting this way. So first, I wanted to gain some context for how fishermen are harvesting, um, their perceptions about the resource and the future of the resource in order to contextualize some of the other studies we were doing. So I talked with fishermen. Um, I did some, I did a series of probably about 12 preliminary interviews with fishermen near Las Cruces to kind of get a handle of some of the terminology they use, which is really important. Species common names have tended to vary a lot as well as, as harvesting methods. I also wanted to um, uh, make sure my questions were going to um, elicit uh, useful data. So after these preliminary interviews, I. I gained interviews from 10 different caletas, which are just the areas where the fishermen gather, store their boats, and sell their stock. Um, so I went to 10 different caletas in four different regions. And these, I chose these caletas on a combination of using um, government data as of um, the amount of kelp harvested in these different areas. I wanted to kind of get a range of, of um, intensities as well as going to places where I had some contacts and um, were actually accessible. Um, and so I interviewed a total of 41 fishermen, and the interviews lasted from sometimes 15 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes, depending on how much the fishermen wanted to share. And I was always really pleasantly surprised by their alacrity to participate. Everyone was really welcoming and kind and inviting me to their house for own say, and it was just <laughs> a really nice way to connect with them. So one of the questions I asked um, was compared to five years ago, whether their, their perception of the amount of kelp has changed. Um, so 
across the board in the four, um, the four different regions are the four different colors you're seeing here, and then we have percentage of people who thought the amount of kelp has decreased, not changed, or increased. And across the different regions, the most common answer was that the amount of kelp's actually decreased. Um, um, and so some of the answers, I, some of the explanations people gave were actually that they thought it was being over-harvested by themselves, or sometimes that there were pollutants, contaminants, climate change, all kinds of other factors that could be affecting this resource. I also wanted to gain an idea of the different types of harvesting methods that these fishermen were practicing and how common the barateo practice was. So again, the four regions and the different colors. And in uh, barateo was the most common practice in regions three, four, and five, all the regions except for um, region 15, that northernmost region, where Barateo is actually illegal. Um, due to historic over-exploitation of the research, it's, it's um, prohibited to use Barateo there. So the most common method was shore collection, so basically just collecting kelp that is washed up on the beach. Although some fishermen in this um, coleta did also mention that they sometimes illegally use Barateo in order to get enough kelp to actually um, support their livelihood. So this is the same um, data, but I've grouped all the regions now. And so I wanted to illust uh, illust highlight this point, that among these different groups of harvesting methods, then I also looked at, um, I asked whether they, the fishermen thought their harvesting method affects the resource. And so these pie charts show for within each method the proportion of fishermen who think yes, in blue, their harvesting method affects the resource, or no, in red, it does not affect. And we see this trend that with increasing use of barateo, there's increasing belief that they have an effect on the resource, that folks just collecting off the shore don't really feel an effect, but if they're doing barateo, perhaps there's um, more uh, wariness that they might be affecting the resource. Okay. So uh, the study that I was participating in ongoing at the university was trying to understand the effect of barateo, this subtitle removal of kelp, on the recruitment of larval invertebrates in the kelp forest, seeing as the kelp serves as habitat and recruitment grounds for lots of different fish and invertebrate species. We were going to tackle one aspect of possible effects of this um, harvesting method. So prior to my arrival there at the university, the researchers had set up experimental plots um, in one of the caletas in the fifth region and had f eight patches of, of kelp forest that were um, laid out. And four of these patches were exposed to barateo uh, treatment. So they hired a fisherman to come in, do barateo as he would in these four patches, and then um, set out these traps to trap the larvae at each of these sites. And the traps basically consist of a kind of plastic netting that's all um, balled up and serves as a substrate for these larvae to recruit onto. And so these were set out at each of the sites um, prior to the barateo treatment, and then one month, two months, and three months later. And actually, we continue to collect during the time I was there, but I'm just showing my analyses for these first few collections. Um, so this is how we collected the, um, the larvae traps to figure out the effect of barateo on recruitment of invertebrates. So this image here is a, a diagram of the kelp frond with the, the larvae traps which were tied right onto the kelp. And then we every month took them out back into the lab, washed them to take out all the larvae, and collected them here through a sieve. And then under the microscope, I counted and identified over 4,000 of these larvae and saw a whole myriad of species from snails to crabs to nudibranchs to sea urchins, so lots of things recruiting into the kelp forest. And then with this data, um, we analyzed whether there was a difference between patches with barateo or without barateo. And so this graph here is a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling plot. And this means um, the axes here have no inherent meaning, but what you're looking at is um, the the amount of similarity between the different points. So points that are closer to each other have more similar larval communities in terms of species of, um, number and abundance, and points that are farther away means that they're more different from each other. And the red dots are the barateo patches, and the, um, the black triangles are the non-barateo patches uh, for the, the three segments after harvest, after um, treatment. 
And so we can see here that there's no distinction between the barateo and non-barateo patches. So it looks like, at least at this scale, um, barateo is not having an effect on the larvae community structure. So in addition to these projects, I wanted to investigate some more um, ecological aspects of this kelp to um, further our knowledge of, of factors that influence the growth of the kelp and how we might work, be working towards the sustainability of harvesting this resource. So previous experiment that was done um, at the station by a researcher found that kelp in aquaria in the lab, we had kelp um, grown with fish in the tank and without fish. And the kelp grown with fish um, grew at about a, a rate about twice as fast as the kelp without fish. And so of course the question here is why would this be? And one of the hypotheses we had could be that fish are excreting um, ammonia, which is a form of nitrogen, which can be used as a nutrient that the, the kelp take up. So in the ocean, the two main forms of nitrogen that kelp are using, like any other primary producer, would be nitrate and O3. And the main source of this is coming from upwelling of, of deeper nutrient-rich waters. And then um, ammonium, which um, so fish excrete ammonia, which under oceanic pH conditions is quickly converted into ammonium, which kelp can take up. And so primary producers actually prefer ammonium. Um, it's, um, it's more readily uh, usable for these um, producers. But the amount of nitrate in the, the ambient amount of nitrate um, vastly outweighs the amount of ammonium in the water. Uh, so the way I wanted to so I conducted an experiment to see whether fish um, nutrients could be affecting the growth of kelp. And the way I thought to um, trace the fish nitrogen was to use nitrogen-stable isotopes. So in nature, nitrogen has two stable isotopes, nitrogen-15 and 14, and they differ by just one neutron. So nitrogen-15 is a little bit heavier. And what we see is that as you move up the food chain, the amount of nitrogen-15 increases at each trophic level. That's because of um, the way that these organs are metabolizing the nitrogen. Um, they're preferentially, preferentially metabolizing the lighter nitrogen. So you see an enrichment of nitrogen-15 as you move up the food chain. And so I thought that if fish are having have this enriched nitrogen, um, I would expect kelp exposed to fish taking up that nitrogen to also show an enrichment in this signal. Um, so before, so I, the first experiment I did was to just see how much ammonia these fish are actually <coughs> excreting, and I was really lucky to um, be put in contact with some professors at the Universidad Playa Ancha in Valparaiso, who were super helpful and um, excited about this project and gave me all sorts of laboratory supplies to be able to do this experiment. So I used um, the herbivorous fish, Aplodectylus punctatus, commonly known as Hergia. And this is um, a fish that lives in the kelp forest, the, the subtitle Lusonia trabeculata forest, and feeds on the algae. And so, um, so I did an experiment with just three different tanks, one fish in each tank, and measuring every three hours the amount of ammonia the fish produced over a course of 12 hours. And so we see here that it produced at a rate of a, almost one uh, micromolar ammonia per hour. So this is actually a lot of ammonia, the amount um, generally in the ocean um, ranges from zero to two, sometimes a little bit more um, micromolars. So um, these fish are definitely producing a lot of ammonium. The question is whether the kelp are taking it up and using it, and, when we can, and if we can trace that. So my second experiment was to test the effect of fish presence on kelp growth and nitrogen enrichment. I had two treatments, and the first was um, with fish, the other was control without fish. So in each tank, um, we collected kelp from just outside the marine reserve and brought them back into the lab. Um, and I had one kelp individual on the side of the tank, a mesh div divider down the middle, dividing the fish and the kelp. And then of course I had to feed the fish something during the experiment that ideally wasn't the kelp I was trying to measure growth of. So I had another batch of kelp, the same species, that I tied to the fish side of the tank and then replicated that for the control treatment as well. Um, so I had three replicates of each treatment and then um, took growth measurements of the kelp and took 
tissue samples from the fish and the kelp to do stable isotope analyses. Here's just a picture of my experimental setup tanks, and it's the top-down view of one of the treatments with fish. There's your fish over there. Um, so in order to measure growth of the kelp, um, you might think you could just kind of measure the length of the blade and how that progresses over time, but the kelp um, naturally deteriorate from the end uh, at the at the end over time. So in order to measure growth, a uh, method that's used is the hole punch method, where you literally just punch a hole in the kelp at a known distance from the base, so I used 10 centimeters, and then trace the distance that that hole moved over time to get an idea of the new growth that was happening in the kelp. I also measured the amount of deterioration by taking the whole length of the blade over time. And so we see that kelp growing with fish presence tend to grow and deteriorate less than kelp without fish. So on this left graph is the amount of growth after 10 days, and um, it was pretty minimal growth just between the about one to three millimeters, um, and it was slightly higher in the control group actually. But kelp decay was substantially less um, in the fish treatment. So kelp with fish were perhaps um, their, their, their growth and decay was kind of slowed by having fish present. Now looking at the nitrogen signatures, so uh, this graph on the x-axis is the carbon isotope and the y-axis is the nitrogen. Um, and we're seeing here that, first of all, fish definitely have a higher nitrogen signature than kelp as expected. So the fish are the red dot up there and all the kelp are at the bottom. So as you would expect going up the trophic levels, fish have enriched nitrogen. Um, and we can see the blue is the kelp prior to experiment prior to the experiment, and the purple is after 10 days with treatment. And the squares here are the fish treatment, and the triangles are the control treatment. So we see, um, oh sorry, and then the gray is the food I was giving the fish. And we see no difference in nitrogen in either of the groups, um, with or without fish. So we're not seeing a signal of nitrogen um, being picked up by these kelp. So some of the conclusions from my studies that, going back to these um, interviews, Barreteo was the most common harvesting strategy in three out of the four surveyed regions. Um, more fishermen who do Barreteo believe that they affect the kelp resource than fishermen who collect on the shore. Um, as far as how this resource is affected, it seems that there's no effect of Barreteo on invertebrate recruitment at the small scale, but we need to look at lots of other factors such as um, how the kelp regrows after barateo. This is, um, there's kind of a lot of information lacking in just the basic um, um, natural history of this particular kelp species, how long it takes to grow to maturity, and kind of what is the standing biomass of that kelp out there. That would be really good studies to do to further um, understand the sustainability of this resource. Um, we learned that fish uh, this particular, especially uh, herbivorous fish I was using, excrete ample ammonia, ample nitrogen, but there's no effect on the um, nitrogen enrichment on the kelp. And a couple thoughts about this. It could be that the kelp um, I collected were from right outside the marine reserve, which has um, one of the largest uh, fish biomass populations in that area. So perhaps they were kind of already imprinted with this higher nitrogen signature and adding one fish in there for a few more days had no further effect. It could also be that um, the ammonium excreted, the ammonium excreted by the fish um, is converted into nitrate, that other form of nitrogen that the kelp can use via microbial processes before the kelp can use it. Um, and so it could be that there's um, the kelp are actually taking up mostly just nitrogen in the form of nitrate. Um, and we also saw, though, that the kelp, that kelp decay is perhaps mitigated with fish presence. And this just opens up a whole bunch of other um, questions as to why this might be. And so when I presented these, actually presented these results yesterday um, in Valparaiso for those, prof uh, the, uh, the lab was for the professors who were helping me out. And they were super excited about this research and invited me back to come uh, continue investigating with them to to further these questions and this study. And so at this point, I'm now um, returning um, 
in a few weeks to the U.S. to continue with my doctoral program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. But I'm really excited to bring back all of this new knowledge I've gained about kelp, before which I knew nothing about, especially kelp harvesting in Chile. And I really hope to work with, um, keep working with my contacts here in Chile, as well as my advisor in California, to develop more projects on Chilean kelp and hopefully form into a chapter of my dissertation and continue collaborating with fishermen as well as scientists here in Chile. I want to thank um, my professors at the at La Católica and other students and staff um, who were really, um, uh, really essential in the success of my project. Um, also, thank you so much to the Fulbright program and um, to all of you lovely writers for your friendship and support during this wonderful experience. Thank you.